the weekends began Friday, going up Friday night. Got a ride up with two folks who were heading up there anyways. And we got to the research station. And upon putting down our bags, Kevin, uh, the station manager, came in, greeted us, shook our hands, and asked us if we'd seen the wolf tracks on the driveway in. And immediately, we grabbed what we needed, tape measures, tracking cards, whatever, put our boots back on, and headed out to the road. Um, we found the wolf tracks in the middle of the road on the driveway in, right beside uh, the portable and the garage, right at the secondary sort of driveway into the research station, and began measuring and tracking these wolves. And at first, there was only one track that we noticed. I think it was a smaller direct register track. And then as we went up the road a little bit more, we started noticing a side trot. And the side trot was a little bit larger than the direct register trail. And we followed them up to the corner. If you're going up the research station, you make a right and you can go towards the station manager's cabin or a left and you can go to more cabins where folks who are staying at the research station can stay. And right at the corner there, there was a bit of a, a scrape, not much, and some urine, some scent marking happening. And we got down immediately and, and my first thought was, oh, this smells like coyote urine. And so we all smelt a little bit and we're like, oh yeah, sort of like coyote urine, but just not quite. It was, it was, it was a little bit different as well. So we kept going. We crossed the dam from Lake Sasajuman. And we, as soon as we crossed the dam, there was a scrape, a T-shaped scrape there. And we, we, we looked at the scrape and noticed that there was a little bit of scat off to the side. Uh, the north side of the scrape, northwest, and then uh, a little bit of urine in the middle. And it looked like one set of tracks had come in first and perhaps another set on top. And we just watched that and we were like, oh, that's interesting. And then we kept going up the trail, up the hill towards the station manager's cabin, towards the Chit Lake Trail. And along the way, we took some measurements. And some of the measurements that I wrote out, and I, I wonder if other folks have different measurements. Again. Yeah. So which one's which? So earlier we had the 28 inch stride and the similar measurements for the foot on the, the smaller set of tracks. Yeah. And then there's a bigger set of tracks, much bigger set of tracks here. That's the 28 inch stride yeah. so and the then stride, the smaller one is 23. Stride is five inches bigger and it is a, the track itself is almost three quarters of an inch wider. Wider. So it's three and three quarters? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the front, and that the front one's two, just three. three and three quarters. Yeah. So I really think like male, female made a pair. Absolutely. Probably, right now, yeah. February is the time of love, time, yeah. right? We're all hanging out. Side trot, direct register. Oh my God. But some of the measurements that I wrote out were that the males, or pardon me, the, the side trot length was about 71.1 centimeters or 28 inches. And the measurements for these tracks were 12.7 centimeters long and 7.6 centimeters wide for the front. Uh, 9.6 width, 9.6 centimeters for the width of the larger track up closer to the super's cottage or, or the station manager's cottage. And 12.4 uh, centimeters long by 7.6 centimeters wide for the rear track. So this was a large, large wolf track. And there was another one beside it. That, that was the side trot. And the, the, the direct register beside it was smaller. And I don't have the measurements for that. But the 
those ones were smaller and we had this idea that the direct register could be a smaller female and the side trot being a larger perhaps a male who is with her and these two tracks continued on towards the station manager's cabin and then up the chit, the chit lake trail and we didn't go up the trail we didn't have snowshoes it was getting dark we don't know our way that well so we turned back and took these measurements and we really start to get to thinking that male and female walking or, or trotting together and perhaps because of the season February 15th and all that perhaps she was going to be coming into Esther sometime soon and he was pursuing her following along waiting till she was receptive to him and maybe everywhere that she was scenting along the way he was scenting as well and this is just putting small pieces together we, we are by far not the best trackers but we're learning and this is part of tracking sometimes is inferring by what you see and what you know and coming up with a bit of a story of the day of what's happened there so we went back to the cabin and, and we sort of debriefed a little bit and we welcomed everyone else as they came and we got ready for the next few days um, in the morning Saturday morning where this story of the day that I'm trying to tell now really begins uh, started as every morning began while we were in Algonquin and that's with a a Highway 60 scouting and what that meant was you'd get in one of two cars and one car would go east uh, towards the east gate and one car would go west towards the west gate and be looking out on either side of the road to see if they saw any tracks or trails coming out and crossing the road and just seeing what we can find and most of the time it was foxes sometimes we saw otter uh, a couple of times folks saw moose uh, one morning we even saw grouse but Saturday morning the big hit was there were wolf tracks and for me going up this week to Algonquin this weekend and then the subsequent week the exciting part was to see wolves or see wolf's sign, see the tracks. And to see the tracks while we were out scouting and then to see the the tracks the night before on our on our road that we were on right past the research station, that felt really cool. That was really exciting to know that these wolves were so close to us, so present in our midst. Even if they, they were they were older they weren't that old they were still pretty fresh um it was it was pretty amazing to see and we saw a couple of uh signs of the wolves nearby some going over the sort of mound put out that was created by the snow plow as it plowed the snow off the highway and uh photo one and two um wolf tracks at the road while scouting uh are, are some photographs of those wolf tracks and number two has my boot, a size nine Sorrel boot uh, for scale. And it's, uh, the photograph three, faint wolf tracks at the road while scouting, is a little bit harder to see. But if you make it out, you can see the claws fairly clearly up at the top of the toes of one of the feet. And uh, some of the toe pads and the claws on the other foot below and to the right that was pretty exciting so we came back to the cabin after scouting along highway 60 after seeing uh, those wolf tracks lots of foxes uh, an otter slide and then we came back when it was decided that we would do we would just pursue the wolves that were right there on the road there was no need to go any further this was exciting we could follow them and see what we could find and there was a lot to find that day um, we headed out First thing we do every morning is a gratitude and set, setting an intention for the day. And we did a big circle of that. Everyone was there, plus uh, two others who were going to be there, for uh, one for the day, one for the week. And then we headed out down the road, back towards the highway, 
but on foot. And we didn't get very far before everybody also noticed those those wolf tracks on the ground. Everybody was taking measurements, but I have to admit that I wasn't paying the most attention to the measurements because we'd already taken some the night before. Um, but we were, we were watching others get into it. And sometimes for me, tracking in a new place takes some warming up. My brain needs to get there. I need to see some tracks, be curious by the tracks, and then I'm down in it and I'm, I'm sucked in. But it takes me a second to uh, to get in the mood, I suppose. So track, or pardon me, for photo four and five is Alexis examining the wolf tracks with others at the apprenticeship and just looking at them and IDing them and offering some ideas on what he's seeing. Further down the road, on the, I guess if you're heading out towards the highway, be on the left side, and if you're coming to the research station on the right side, uh, someone had noticed an otter slide. And this was pretty cool, because I had seen one once before with the tracking apprenticeship in the Boyne Valley, north of Orangeville. But seeing the otter slide so close and having a chance to actually measure it and not actually being out on ice was pretty cool. And so we went and we looked at this otter slide uh, at the driveway to the research station. And it was pretty amazing to just recognize, you know, these, these otters are always there. Even though I may have never seen one, they are present. Kind of like the wolves, here are these mystical animals that I don't get to encounter very often. And I really appreciate seeing this slide. And if you could climb over uh, the snow bank left behind by the snow plow on the other side, leading up from the Madawaska River, were the tracks and the trail of two otters. And it was pretty neat because I'd watched some trail cam videos beforehand. Uh, before we made our way up to Algonquin. And it helped me think about the otters as pairs. Often they're as pairs and they're hanging out together. And it was pretty neat. I, I, I'd never seen that before, never noticed it before, but here were the tracks that were fairly, fairly ob obvious. And I wrote down in some of my notes that we measured the trough left behind from the otters sliding down the roadside of the snowbank, and it was about 21 centimeters or eight and a half inches wide which is in the narrow end, narrower end of the middle range for otter slides uh, it wasn't my first time seeing an otter slide i wrote but the longest one the longest one i had seen until later this week when some downhill slides were longer than my tape measure which is about 3.6 meters. So this was a, a, a beautiful find right away on the first day of tracking, directly after seeing wolf trails. So this weekend was already shaping up to be a wonderful weekend. Down by the otter slide, um, or the otter tracks emerging from the Madawaska, was a mouse trail. And I could tell it was the mouse trail because, as, as Alexis likes to point out, it's kind of got these Mickey Mouse look to it. The rear tracks landing in front of the front tracks in a bound, and the rear tracks of the mice are larger than the front. So they're kind of like the ears that are sticking out of Mickey's head, and the rear tracks sort of make up the rest of the head that you would imagine on Mickey Mouse. And it's pretty neat. This is a really common track that I see a lot of places and very interesting to come across. But in Algonquin, I wasn't sure of which mice, which mice species lived there. I, I assumed uh, some mice species, but I wasn't sure who is there and who might not, who might be hibernating at this time. And I think that uh, the jumping mice, the meadow jumping mouse, and the woodland jumping mouse would be hibernating at the time. Or some sort of torpor. But the deer mouse or the white-footed mouse would be active. 
And now I've come to feel quite frustrated with the phrasing of uh, white-footed mouse or the deer mouse. To see these species, I find that they're nearly non-identifiable in the field. And I think the only way for that I, from my research is that you have to do it genetically and maybe some habitat specialization between them. But otherwise, they're the same. Maybe some like to be by the water, some like to be by the trees. But there's doesn't seem to be any real distinction of, of species, any real defined speciation between them. So from now on, I have decided since this weekend that they will be now known as the white-footed deer mouse. So, onward. There was a white-footed deer mouse trail leading from one tree to another at the base of the far hill coming up from the Madawaska River. And I was just thoroughly in wonder at what species it was. But now I know. It's a white-footed deer mouse trail. Is it a whole new species? Is it the same species I always see? It's probably the same species we always see, but in a new context of Algonquin Park. So we continued following up the hill, down to the otter slide again, back to the road, and then we started foretracking uh, the, the wolf trail again instead of backtracking back to this otter slide. When we got up a little ways ahead and other people noticed that second uh, wolf trail coming in, uh, there started to be a little bit of debate. Folks were wondering, is there two or is there three wolves? And I still hold to the position that there were two wolves, but some folks who are definitely better trackers than I am um, consider there three. And I think that's prob probably one of the failings of just getting into things that morning is I could have asked more questions on how do we tell the difference between one or, or, or two wolves and a third? Like what signs am I looking for if I'm looking in a direct register trail to define that there might be one extra wolf that I'm not paying attention to? Now... We followed the same trail that we took the night before up to the corner of the dam, of the road that way that led to the dam. And when I had explained the night before to Lee Earl, one of the expedition leaders who was helping out with Alexis with the week and the weekend of tracking, she challenged me and it was a great challenge. I said the the wolf urine smelled like smelled like coyote urine, and she then asked, "And what does that smell like? What what does coyote urine smell like?" And I said, "Well, it smells like." And I was at a loss. What does coyote urine smell like? How do I describe this to someone who's never smelled coyote urine? And believe me, very few people have actually got down and smelled coyote urine. Most people look at me funny when I say that I have. And I think she was right. I needed a better way to elaborate on what coyote urine smells like. And so when we got to this this urine, that I knew it was there from the night before, but I had now a whole team of trackers with us, I asked everyone, can you smell this and describe it for me? Can we take notes as to what this might smell like? And, and so that I can develop a better language to describe the urine of these wolves. So I'm scenting smoky. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that. It's almost like a barbecue. Yeah, it's almost like a barbecue. Yeah. Barbecue, smoky. I want to smoke. It's not um, as armpity. Not as armpity as that one. Yeah, wolf urination. Do you want to get down there? I'm, we're, I'm trying to give good words instead of just saying, it's kind of like a coyote. <laughs> so. I'm so excited to smell this urine. <laughs> Step aside, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Only here would this happen. Yeah, just, just waft it up a little bit. Yeah. I'm not fond of it. You're not fond of it. Uh, Tell me what you sent. <laughs> like, 
barbecue chips with something else on it. Something that's like burnt like sesame seeds. Burnt, burnt sesame seeds. So burnt. we're all getting a little bit burnt smoky burnt, burnt, burnt flavor. <laughs> Yeah, burnt sesame seeds. That's a great description. Burnt sesame seeds. Yeah, definitely burnt sesame seeds. Want to smell it? Burnt sesame oil. Burnt sesame seeds. Yeah. Yeah. What do you got, Annie? Smelling that one compared to that. Urine. Urine. The smelling urine. But like. Fucking sweet spill. She smelled urine. It was the urine. Any descriptors? You were experienced with dementia. So she was in your family. It kind of smells like pee. Oh, yeah. Pee, eh? But. But it's subtle. Ses sesame seed oil. Sesame yeah. seed oil. Yeah. 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 Rancid. Rancid, rancid, rancid sesame it. seed oil. Yeah. I don't yeah. get the sharp metallic <laughs> sense from the rancidness though. I, those I, that's what it smells like. Oh, so strong. So strong. Yeah. Whose feet are those? And for some reason, that made the most sense. That's what the wolf urine smelled like: burnt sesame oil. And I still can't figure out what it is on the landscape that the wolves are eating that may smell. Or render their urine to smell like burnt sesame oil. and But that is a very appropriate smell. And I, I wonder, I still wonder, what is it that they're eating? What, what part of their physiology changes their urine or changes whatever they're eating? Or, or whatever fluids they're getting that they're passing. What is it in their kidneys that makes it smell like burnt sesame oil? We moved on from there. This this delay of asking everybody to smell the urine had allowed others to move ahead and cross the dam and begin looking at the scrape. And I came up behind everybody, and I'm not sure what they discussed about the scrape. I just didn't have the chance to discuss it with them. But there was something neat that they were also looking at beside the scrape, and there was a small trail, very narrow trail width. And the trail width was or the trail was winding from sort of the driveway that had been plowed and then down between some trees into a small little small little divot on the landscape and around. And Alexis uh, was talking to other folks about some nips on some small shrubs in front of the trail and had asked generally, whose trail was this? And I get excited. These kind of questions, when I'm asked a question, that's what gets the juices flowing. That's what gets my brain going. If I wasn't fully into it, this trail, that question, got my brain going. So I got into the snowbank, and I looked around, and I saw this trail. And it began looking like one foot placed directly in front of the other, with a very little space between them, very short stride length. And perhaps not a mammal foot, which I was expecting, but a bird foot. And I was thinking about the distance apart, and I couldn't really make out the angle right away. But the distance apart, perhaps nipping on small shrubs in front of it, and I think I called out spruce grouse. And I think most folks disagreed, not a spruce grouse, but a rough grouse. So I, I'm fine with that. That I got the grouse right. And folks, yeah, they agreed it was, it, was, it was a rough grouse. And the chance to go over and see the nipped buds on the beaked hazel um, that was in front of the trail was pretty exciting. I like seeing that. I've read many times before that the grouse likes to eat the buds off of uh, small growth. And I'd seen scat many times before of the grouse but never never some of the feeding sign so that was that was pretty exciting to see especially on the beaked hazel because then it got me looking more intently at the growth patterns at the bud shapes and of the beaked hazel and the beaked hazel was a plant that we'd got to interact with more in august the last time we were up in algonquin with the apprenticeship 
we left the Rough Grouse Trail and continued along the Wolf Trail until we got to the edge of the station manager's driveway and the, pardon me, the Chit Lake Trail. And we got on our snowshoes and we hoofed it down the Chit Lake Trail. And one of the first neat signs that we came to was a very, very well-worn hemlock tree full of sap wells. Tons of sap wells, little tiny holes in it where a yellow-bellied sap sucker had been really making work on the, on the bark. And to some extent, there were some so perfectly structured that they almost looked like zippers going up and down the side of the bark. This this tree was well dug into, but it didn't seem to have any effect on the foliage. I think this tree was fully alive, doing quite well. So it was quite an awesome sight. And for me, I love hemlocks. And I think this is the first time I really paid attention to sapsucker wells on hemlock trees. And from what I've been reading, they, that's that's a that's a thing. Yellow bellied sapsucker like hemlock. I didn't know. But that was pretty cool because I really appreciate the hemlocks and to see them in Algonquins also very exciting. After the sapsucker after the sapsucker wells, uh, we kept going along this wolf trail that was a little bit vague or how do I say uh, confused by the deep snow and I, uh, my struggle all week was direction of travel luckily I'd seen it before it got to the deep snow but I'm really struggling with with understanding direction of travel in a context of deep snow it's very difficult for me but I, I've been learning a lot through this week in Algonquin, and it was very helpful. But there was another species that made it more difficult to understand direction of travel, and especially later on in the week, but having folks there was really helpful, and that was moose. And as we went down the wolf trail, we came across moose tracks, and these tracks were huge. It was the trail woods. I remember doing it but I didn't take any notes but I did measure the moose beds that we came across and one of them was about three feet wide at its narrowest and about 61 inches long and another one later was similar but five five feet long that's incredible I've measured tons of deer beds, and I've, I've, I've hung out with deer beds a lot down in southern Ontario where I live. But up in Algonquin, these moose beds were massive. Someone could crawl in a ball, curl in a ball, and fit into these moose beds. It was fantastic. And almost in every moose bed we found that week, there was moose hair. Lots of it sometimes. And melted into the snow, often moose scat. And something I noticed on the first day was that the moose scat was larger than the moose scat we'd seen in the summertime. And Stephanie, one of the other apprentices, and I began wondering at this. Why is it larger in the wintertime? Why is it smaller? Alexis taught us something that we didn't know. He, he, he let us know a new bit of information. Uh, moose in the summertime, eat about 10 pounds of food, and in the winter, consume about 40 pounds of food. So perhaps that surplus in food that they're eating in the winter makes it so their scat is larger and maybe drop more frequently. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Another neat conversation that came up uh, as relatable in image 14 was urine deposits. Uh, Alexis asked the question when we came across this urine as to whose urine was this? Was it male or was it female? And this became a lengthy conversation that actually occurred over many days throughout the week of how do females urinate and how do males urinate, human and non-human. 
And it was a really good conversation because a lot of uh, males had assumptions about how females uh, urinate and like spray and uh, females or, or a lot of the women in our group challenged these assumptions that some males had. You know, there is no spray. It's, it's a very narrow stream that falls into one spot. And there were some assumptions about how males urinate, something like a fire hose, for example, just whipping around everywhere due to the pressure and creating, creating tons of spray all over the place. And there was some talking back and forth and, and correcting assumptions and offering other ways of looking at things. And I think that uh, we all learned a lot there. And it became an ongoing conversation throughout the week to the point where folks went off and were observing how they urinate when they were peeing outside and bringing back what they're noticing, sharing what they've seen and informing the group. Thus, we can learn better as to how perhaps the wild animals are urinating. So the one spot we, we saw as photographed in image 14, was likely a female. We also saw a Martin walking trail further down the trail, and I'd seen Martin uh, two by two lopes and three by four lopes, but this was the first walking trail. So that was pretty neat to see. And, and later, like leading up from that trail was a Martin body print, which happened to be sitting just behind a maple tree where on the other side of the maple tree was a white-footed deer mouse trail. And it looked as if perhaps that Martin was laying down behind the maple tree in wait for the white-footed deer mouse to emerge to be the Martin's dinner. It's pretty neat. Pretty neat to see the stories written on the land. We saw some moose feeding sign as we went along. And then... Uh, we broke off into different groups after lunch, uh, just small groups, just to take different trails. Uh, I and Steph Stephanie and I uh, went a little bit further on the trail, whereas Alexis and everyone else ducked across a stream. And they went off one by one across the stream, whereas Stephanie and I didn't even think about it. And we walked together across this frozen stream on the frozen stream for quite a ways. And Alexis told us later that he was kind of concerned because these streams, we weren't sure how how thick the ice may be. And perhaps it wasn't that thick at all. And we only found out later when Alexis fell through that it wasn't actually that thick. Um, across the stream and into the woods again and up and down some hills we found more moose beds and moose scat thoroughly frozen together and a neat thing that we found was a moose incisor scrape i think it's a moose incisor scrape it's, it's 29.5 centimeters and the reason why i say a moose incisor scrape was because the incisor scrapes of a moose only go up. What I mean is that uh, let's let's just look at the photograph, image twenty six. If you look at the base of the photograph, there are some clean incisions on the bottom from the incisors to cut into. That's what incise means to cut into. And they sort of scrape upwards, and all the dangly wood pieces and barks. Uh, trimmings and dangly bits are all sort of dangling up but connected at the top it's not as if they'd been torn and pulled out and down but instead as if they've been uh, sliced from the bottom and are now springing out and I want to read uh, from page 591 from Mammal Tracks is signed by Mark Albrock in the first edition and it says, for ungulates, the structure of the mouth is especially important in understanding the sign of ungulates eating inner bark. Upon close inspection of sign, you will note that all the motion is made upward or angled upward depending on the position of the head. 
This important feature helps differentiate feeding sign from antler rubs, which result from two directional movement, up and down. Ungulates can only scrape bark up because they have no teeth in the upper jaw at the front of the mouth. And this was important for me to understand this feeding sign. And I struggled with this. I struggled with this before and I struggled with this for this week while we were in Algonquin. How to tell the difference between an incisor scrape versus an antler rub. And I'm pretty sure that this depicted in image 26 is an incisor scrape. We took a long roundabout way of, of finding our way through the woods and turned around. We had to backtrack ourselves just to be sure that we weren't going to get ourselves lost. And as we came across the creek once more and into the woods, just where Stephanie and I had split off from the main group, there was a snowshoe hare. And I got a faint photo of the snowshoe hare. Maybe you can point it out for yourself. I won't point out where in the photo 27 is the snowshoe hare. But it might be quite obvious. It was not obvious for me where the snowshoe hair was. They blended in so well with all of the surrounding background. I was amazed. I pulled out the monocular and was watching. And it was almost all entirely white. But I noticed the ears. The ears were a little bit tipped in gray. And it was quite a wonderful sight. I'd never seen a snowshoe hair before. And it was quite a wonderful trip. Uh, further on the trail, and a lot of the trail was spent in line behind others waiting to look at things or just in rows because snowshoeing was a lot easier when you let other people break the trail in front of you or you were in the trail, you were breaking trail in front of everybody else and we were all going in a line. So I took a photo of Alistair's snowshoes there, image 28, and that's, that was a big part of the week, staring down at the person in front of you, snowshoes. But image 29 shows some bear claws and some balsam fur. And this is another one of those signs on the land that if you weren't paying attention before, this will help you. This will help you focus and pay close attention. So I really appreciated those. And I took the measurements. But then it seemed kind of isolated from something that I was focused on and isolated from what I do most of my time here so that's a bit of an archival note but we came out on Lake Sasajuan and one of the beautiful things was walking back along this lake that a few months before we've been canoeing on and I love this I love I love interacting with a land base in a different way whereas again like only months before we were just canoeing here with lush vegetation growing in the lake uh, there is a soldier weed or so, soldier pond weed I can't remember the name of the of the plant and here we were walking along on top with a warm wind blowing against us many of us were tired you can see how far back some folks are and it was great, the wind blowing at us. I think I broke into some Bon Jovi and ACDC just to keep my spirits up. Um, and for that last home stretch, when you turn and you see on the far end of the lake, uh, one of the cabins from the research station, it's quite a reward after a long day of hiking. That was a small account of our journey across through uh, Algonquin Park, the Chit Lake Trail, looking at Wolf and Moose and Martin Trails. And I hope that this sort of method of recording the audio of what I would have written up uh, entertained you, was novel and interesting. And maybe next time I'll try it again or I'll go back to the written format just to see how that works out. Thank you for listening. Happy tracking.